On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Clayburgh Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. On Story, presented by Austin Film Festival. A look inside the creative process from today's leading writers and filmmakers. This week's On Story, Netflix's Master of None Emmy Award-winning writer and creator, Alan Yang. I still remember being on set the first or second day, and some, there's some crisis. I mean, there's a crisis every day, but, you know, something's going on, and a decision needs to be made, and Aziz and I are looking around, and we're like man, like, who's, the, who's like, the dad on set to, like, just take care of this? And we're like, shit, we're the dads. Like, this is, oh, my God, like, we got to make this decision. Like, this is insane. In this episode, Alan Yang discusses how drawing from personal experience and family helped shape Master of None's comedy writing. Let's just start off with a little bit of uh, your background. Uh, you grew up in uh, San Bernardino, California. Yeah, so my parents are from Taiwan. So my parents are both immigrants, and they got married in Taiwan, and then they, for some reason, decided to move where Vince Gilligan wanted to set Breaking Bad. <laughs> how did uh, how did that inform your kind of point of view or your approach? You know, it, approach? It's, a, it's a funny question because it's the kind of thing where when I was a when I was a little bit younger, um, I didn't want anything to do with it. I was like, I want to write, so I want to prove that I can write anything, right? I wanted, I don't want to be the guy like that guy writes great Asian stuff. It's like I don't want to be that guy, right? I don't want to be the guy who writes Asian things. Um, um, so definitely, you know, when I was a younger writer, um, I just wanted to prove that I could write anything. And, and fortunately, at that stage in my career anyway, I was working on other people's shows. So, you know, I worked briefly on South Park, and then I was on Parks and Rec for a long time. And those were shows created by other people and, and gave, the gave me the opportunity to sort of learn from them and, and, and sort of um, be confident enough in my own ability to, to honestly get more in touch with what is specific and more unique about me, right? So um, I, I think it really, I think it's really, it, it plays a part in who you are. And even even though you might deny it when you're younger, you know, people have different approaches to how they mature and, and, and how they come to terms with who they are. And I'm still doing it right now. I wouldn't say that I'm a finished product by any means. Um, but yeah, just to give you an example, like, you know, my high school is very diverse. It was, uh, it was probably majority, min uh, majority minority, w by which I mean, you know, white people were probably fewer than half the population, you know, it was probably 40% Latino and 15 or 20% black. And when you would walk around at lunch, um, you know, it was, it was kind of de facto segregated where you could walk around and be like, you know, the Latino kids sit here and the black kids kind of sit over here. The white kids sit over here. And I, I still remember, you know, uh, a girl started passing me notes in class, and I was very oblivious and stupid. She maybe had a shit a crush on me or something, but she started passing me notes in class, and uh, and uh, you know after a few days, she she passed me a note that said, "Why don't you ever have lunch at the Asian tree?" Because there was a tree with like there were like four Asian kids. Right, that was a whole school like five Asian kids. They all ate at the same tree. Like sadly, you know, eating their packed lunches. Um, but yeah, so you know, I went to a high school where there there weren't that many Asian kids, so. It was to me. It was like, okay, I get along with everyone. I learned to get along with everyone, and and that also was a big part of um, you know informing who I who I became later, and and, and uh, you know teaching me to get along with the different kinds of people. Um, but yeah, I'm still doing it right now. And you know, obviously, in Master of None, we uh, we explore that a little bit more. I mean, there's an episode that's basically about uh, Aziz's parents and my parents, and that's all. You know, a lot of that is factual. Like. We're not actually very good writers. That's just stuff stolen from real life. Like, <laughs> that's just like, we wrote down what our parents told us and then shot it. Ma, what about your first day in America? That must have been pretty exciting. No, I just got dropped off from the airport and your father went to work. I didn't know nobody and I barely knew your father. We had an arranged marriage and I knew him only for a week or so. Well, what about that first day though? Did you go out and explore the city? No, I sat in the couch and cried. Well, that's really sad. It's really the closest thing to to uh, to a kind of a, a college version of a writer's room because you go in there and you're incredibly intimidated. There's 
you know, 15 people there who, who have more experience than you. They're really funny. They're really mean. And, you know, you, there's pressure on you for whenever you're talking to, like, is this guy going to be funny? Like, even when you're just watching TV, you're like, is this guy going to be funny? You know, uh, you know, you're just scared to talk. And that's how some people feel when you first start on a job. You know, you go to the writer's room. You don't know how it's going to be. You're a big fan of the show, maybe. You're like, you know, Trey Parker and Matt Stone are there, and they're doing the Carbon voice and pitching in it, and, like, you have to pitch. Like, that's scary, man. That's really scary. But, you know, on the Lampoon, it was a good, a good you know, kind of, you know, training ground for that because you go in there and, and, and you have to sort of break the ice and people hate you at first and then maybe you say a few things that are funny, maybe you say a few things that aren't, and then you learn. And you just want to hang out with these really smart, funny people. And so that's, you know, I spent a lot of time there and I still have a lot of friends from the Lampoon from when I was in school. And it became this kind of incubator for SNL. Yes, and for very much the so. Simpsons yes, and Conan O'Brien, you know, uh, I worked there, and then Greg Daniels, who created The Office and King of the Hill, and Parks and Rec, worked there, and uh, and and uh, you know, a lot of, and also going back, you know, uh, you know, uh, Robert Benchley and John Updike, and and yeah, so there's a there's a long history of actual talented writers who work there. So I wrote for a blog called Fire Joe Morgan which was a baseball commentary commentary blog. It sort of became a place where whenever you were watching TV and heard someone say something stupid or read something on the internet that was stupid about baseball, you would copy and paste it into an email and send it to the list and be like, can you believe this guy said this? And then make, write some jokes making fun of them. Eventually, the volume of these emails became so overwhelming that people started writing the list and saying, hey guys, if you're gonna write these many emails about like, like making fun of co baseball commentary, please don't do it on the email list. Like this is for like, just like meeting up and stuff. So they're like, go start a blogger account. So one of us started a blogger account. Two of the people who were crazy enough to keep writing on this account were me and Mike Schur, um, who ended up creating Parks and Rec. And uh, it was not like a thing where I didn't really know Mike, like I had maybe shaken his hand once or twice, he's a little bit older than I was. And so um, years later, so year, cut two years later, Mike and I have been writing on the blog for literally every day for like three years. <laughs> like he was writing on the, like it's insane. It was like, it was the time like that book Moneyball came out. So a lot of it was kind of about Moneyball stuff. And long story short, years later, Mike gets what is listed as the office spinoff at the time, which was very interesting. And, and so I was like, oh, I should send my pilot over to Mike. And I had written some pilot, and Mike read it. And he was like, it's good. Um, you know, Greg is the co-creator. He has to read it also. So I waited a few months for Greg to read it. And then Mike, Mike and Greg and I met. And Mike is like, well, fortunately, I've read probably two million of your words of comedy writing over the past three years, and, and I know you're funny, so um, that probably helped a little bit. And so that's how I started season one. Of, I, you know, I, I, uh, there are very few writers season one. We only did six episodes, and there were like five of us. Um, and so, you know, we were still figuring the show out, and, you know, it was a spinoff for a long time. It was going to be Rashida and God knows who, who else, but uh, um, yeah, and, and, and that's how I started on that show, and, and it, was, it was such a fun run there. Just to be clear, the way a writer's room like that works is, you know, you break almost all of the stories as a group. So you go in and you're, you have all of these stories. You come in before the season and we, we do what we call, we, we call blue skying sometimes, which is like, okay, man, we have a whole season of television to write. Um, what are our big ideas that might be possible? So you talk about arcs, you talk about what might happen for each character. So you might pitch, you know, uh, okay, so the end of last season, the government was shut down. So how are they going to make up that deficit? So you might pitch like, oh, they throw a big harvest festival and it's a big gamble and they're going to put a lot of money into it. But they think that if they do it right, they'll make money back and, and make up the deficit. OK, so we know the people who run this government have no faith in us. My plan is going to change that and bring the budget back. And the answer has been right in front of us the whole time. Ew, check your testicles. No, not that. Although that is very good advice. I'm looking at you, Jerry. No. What's gonna save us is right there. Gentlemen, I realize that times are tough and the budget is tight. But if the people of this town have nothing else to do but sit in their houses and play video games, then Pawnee will die. And we refuse to let that happen. Okay, that seems to lend itself to other ideas. So what are the episodes that fit into that arc? You know, you'll, they'll do one where they have to publicize it. They go on the media. They go on a radio show. You do one where you're getting vendors. You do one, you know, so that kind of starts flowing, and, and you start writing down note cards. And from that point, you know, you just have 
basically tons and tons of cork boards covered with ideas. Um, and then you start paring down. And, and, and on Parks and Rec, you know, Mike was a showrunner. So, you know, he goes through and picks ideas he likes and, and, and starts, you know, maybe splitting the room up and dividing it up into who, you know, he thinks might write a, uh, and do a good job writing a specific episode. And so, yeah, and so sometimes, you know, you'll write someone else's idea, they'll write your idea. So it's all very, very, uh, you know, it's all very, uh, I don't know, what's the word, symbiotic and, and, and working together and all that stuff. Were you, uh, were the characters already kind of created and you came in or did you? Uh, Mike and Greg had a pilot written. And so uh, they had written a pilot with, with, you know, a lot of those characters are in there, you know, Leslie, Ron, um, uh, uh, Tom, and, and, and uh, April's in it a tiny bit, um, and Rashida's character, and, and, and uh, you know, Anne. And, and, and so they're, they're in there. But we did do a thing where, you know, as all good writers do, I think they wanted to test, test those characters and test the, the sort of strength of that story and, and the whole setup of the show. And, and as people know, you know, that show evolved and changed so much. And so um, we did do a thing where even in those early days, uh, you know, every character had their own board. And I was like, okay, let's talk about what Leslie might do in this situation, what Ron might do in this situation, what Tom might do. And that stuff is is stuff that appears to me, that's that's like an iceberg. When you do that work, what you see appears above the surface of the water, but all of that work is 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 lifting it up above the surface and 90% of the iceberg is below the surface. So, you know, you've done a lot of that leg work, you've done a lot of the sort of uh, background stuff, and, and it really comes to, comes to play when you're writing the characters. And in some cases, I would say in all cases on that show, the actor starts really informing the character as well. I mean, you wouldn't believe how much stuff we outright stole from Nick Offerman's live, from Amy's live, from Aziz's live. Chris Pratt's character was designed to be a guest star who was supposed to be written off the show in episode six of season one. It's like, thank God we kept that guy around because he's very likable. Um, but yeah, so so we changed his character completely because it was like, well, this guy's a, a, a human golden retriever. Like, we can't make him a... a the show it makes no sense like he's like the most likable human being anyone's ever met so let's keep him on the show and just tailor the character towards him you wanted to hold a thousand dollars cash in your hands that's super disappointing 998 999 1000 yes now this is what i imagined <laughs> Have you ever seen this much cash in your entire life? I just handed it to you. <laughs> nickels. I want nickels. A billion nickels. No, Andy. That's also the beauty of television is that it's it's a character driven medium. I know that's a cliche and you've heard it before, but it's really true because what, why are people tuning in? They're tuning in to hang out with these people, especially on a show like Parks and Rec, which is, you know, it's not it's not Breaking Bad where it's like a cliffhanger, like what's gonna happen, like who's gonna die? It's like, it's, no, it's you wanna hang out with these people. So, so you, would be, you would be a fool, I think, not to take the essential elements from these human beings who are playing these characters and, and sort of imbue the characters with their characteristics in some cases. You know, I worked very briefly on, on South Park and, and, uh, and uh, you know, Trey Parker and Matt Stone are such geniuses, they're such great writers. Um, and I worked on Parks and Rec with Greg Daniels and Mike Schur, like, and Greg, you know, and Mike are both so great too. Like Greg has done a thousand episodes of TV and there's nobody more different than Trey Parker and Greg Daniels. It's like, like Greg is like a, you know, he's, he's a, he's a, he's a nerd. And like, he like, you know, he's a, he's like really, he's like a social experimenter and like, he's like a professor and Trey is like crazy. Like Trey's like, you know, like, you know, he, he, you know, every, people know what he's like, but, but honestly, like in terms of st- writing and like story breaking they had so much in common like they, they literally like these two guys are like you know they they they've done so many episodes of television and and one thing they always talked about was the primacy of story the primacy of story and character and honestly f- forget about jokes like even like if you're doing kind of like forget about jokes on one level like you know, uh, Matt and Trey used to say a thing in the writers' room was like, "No one's laughing if they don't care about the characters. No one's laughing. Number one is, does this seem? Is this a situation that I care about? Are these people that I care about? Do like, does this seem like a, a real situation? You know, like that's what that's why you know going back to the last question, like, does this seem real? And so those two disparate men who could not be more different just would always hammer, forget 
forget the jokes. Like, you know, they would sometimes dismissively call them gags. Like, we'll do the gags later. Like, you know, we can write that in the script phase. But when we're talking about writing, we're talking about who are these people? How are they behaving? How are they motivated? And what is the situation that, that is compelling the audience to keep watching? Let's do a show that feels, we didn't want it to feel exactly the same, obviously, and now Aziz was the lead, so um, we wanted to really filter it through what our lives were like, and what that was, to me, a lot of the most interesting stuff was, okay, that was a workplace ensemble show, we wanted our show to be a little bit uh, more grounded, a little bit more cinematic, um, and, and reflect what we were going through, and what we were, you know, we were, you know, we're, you know, 30-ish guys uh, living in New York, and um, sort of, a you know, the character in the show is a lot more adrift than Aziz. Like, Dev is not playing Madison Square Garden in the context of Master of None. But, um, you know, but but on the same, on the basically, on an inner life, you know, on the level of his inner life, it, it's like, okay, you're a little bit adrift. You don't, you can't make up your mind. I mean, that was very, that was really relevant to us. And so that was some of the tone of what we want to get across. Can you walk me through, like, having your, having an idea from something that happened in your life and how it gets into a show. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it, it's boy. There's an episode this year that I, I haven't told my dad about that that I don't think he's gonna be happy with me. But uh, <laughs> for, so so just just as a just as a very very one to one literal example um, for the parents episode of, of Master of None, the, the, the uh, you know we had this opportunity with a show that we were very excited about that. that, that it, it only dawned on us after the passage of some time. And basically what happened is we um, we sold that show to Netflix much earlier than I think people realized. We sold it while we were working on Parks and Rec. And we just didn't know. That show, every year, NBC would say, yeah, well, we don't know if it's going to come back. We don't know if it's come back. And, and so me and Aziz sold this show, and then it got picked up for another year. So Parks and Rec got picked up for season seven, and he and I went back to work on that show. And in the meantime, we had this kind of we had this year. We had another year to think about the show. And the show we pitched to Netflix was very much, uh, it was a little half. It was a little like, it's Aziz and he's single and he has some friends and it's in New York. <laughs> and they're like, we, we want it. It's like, wow, that's great. Like, that's, yikes. Um, so so we, 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 took, we took a month off parks at, at a certain point and, and we were like, wow, we, we have this massive opportunity. And how, how lucky is it that we get to make our own show? And, and specifically at a place, at a network that will probably give us a fair amount of creative freedom. So we're like, wow, we, we cannot squander this. What are we going to do that is you know, ambitious and, and original and, and just so something we haven't seen before? And so you know, we're beating our heads against the wall. And we had some ideas. We, had, you know, we wrote down some stuff on cards. And, and you know, we wanted it to be personal. But... You know, it ended up. It ended up. Uh, you know, we were in. We were in a hotel room in New York, just kind of again running into a brick wall. And I was like, you know, man, whatever happens, like, you know, this is all. Uh, this is. This is. You know, it feels like we're in a tough spot right now. But whatever happens, like, you know, my dad grew up in literally like a hut in Taiwan, like the size of like the corner of this stage, with like, you know, his two brothers and a single mom, and he literally had so little that he had a pet chicken and he had to kill his pet chicken and eat it for dinner. Like, that's where he was in life. And now his son gets to, like, fart around New York and come up with ideas for a TV show. It was good seeing you, Dad. Before you go, can you run and get me a package of rice from the store? Sorry, I can't. I'm supposed to meet a friend to see a movie, and I love answering those movie trivia questions they put up before the show. So I'm just going to head out, I think. Is he's like, is that story true? I was like, yeah, it's totally true. He's like, that's so insane. Like, that's way more interesting than anything, any dumb idea we've talked about all day. Like, that should be the show. Like, let's just put that in the show. That episode 
is the second episode, and it has nobody from the first episode in it except Dev, the main character. You know, it's just no one, none of his friends. Any, it's like no one's in this. No, so it's like wow, like you can just any any episode can be any idea. And so, um, once we had that, it was literally like all this stuff from my real life where you know. Uh, you know, I'm a, to my dad, like, you know, I can't communicate with him. He, all he does is email me articles from The Economist, like all that stuff is in there. Like it's, that is 100% true. Like it, that's all like real stuff. And disease stuff likewise, you know, it actually was an instance of life imitating art where we called our dads and just learned more about their lives because I didn't know anything about him. Like I, I still, I'm learning. Like I actually went back to Taiwan in December with my dad for the first time since I was seven and he showed me his hometown and 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 it's still happening you know so so that stuff is all you know it's that that's the stuff that's really meaningful to me and and that's the stuff we want to put in because it's because we're actually passionate about it in real life and it's affecting our real lives Talk to me about uh, you and Aziz's relationship. We didn't like specifically work together that much on that show because he was just an actor and I was a writer and so you know you know, he's not in the writer's room and I'm only on set when, when I'm, uh, it's my episode or I'm directing or anything like that. And, uh, it was a more, more of a thing where sometimes he would text me about, uh, parts of, parts of episodes or whatever. And, and I would, I would talk to him and it was more like we were just hanging out. And so it was kind of a leap of faith for both of us to be like, okay, we're going to, we're going to embark on this partnership, creating this show. And it was based on the fact that we got along and we just kind of trusted that we'd also work well together. And we actually do. I, th I think we have a lot of common commonalities where, um, we're both very uh, obsessive, and we try to hide our our, our, our utter confusion at the beginning. Um, but um, no, it was it was really fun, man. And, and and to get to create your own show and 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 really be at the helm and and make those decisions, uh, whether they be correct or whether they be wrong, um, is is it, it was we, we were we were really happy. We were really happy to be able to do that. Something that is interesting with uh, Master of None, I've noticed, is that they do, uh, they're not standalone, but each episode, in a way, seems to have almost a standalone theme. We don't want any of these episodes to feel disposable or like it's, it's filler or like it's just connective tissue. You know, it's like, to me, look, it's, it's, it's an episode. Like, this should feel not only like a complete story, but it should feel like, Wow, there's a bigger idea or emotion or 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 or, or something really really uh, you know larger than just the story. So I and by that I mean that that's very vague and I think intentionally so where it's not always like everyone has to have a social issue or everyone has to have this really you know some romantic you know to me look there's definitely room for all kinds of uh, of entertainment and there's there's there, I love popcorn entertainment, I love blockbusters, I love movies that are just fun. But you know, we wanted the show to to in some ways be about something not necessarily in a preachy way we never want to be after school especially or 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 didactic or anything like that but but you know why not have it be about someone man like have it you know you know if people are going to talk about it afterwards that's great or if if this one's more of an emotional one it's like wow i really i can really relate to that um yeah we want every episode not necessarily to have a theme or to be about an issue, but more, ha you know, have something bigger behind it, you know, is have some have some larger reason to exist that, you know, you'd be proud to show this single episode and an audience could watch it even if they weren't a huge fan of the show. Like, oh, that one's about this. And I get that, you know. I want to talk just in a more general sense about your writing process. You know, as much as possible for any movie I'm writing and for for the show, it, what's something that really impacted me? What's something that you know made me feel really strongly? What's something that made me cry or you know put me on the verge of tears? Or what was something really funny? Those to me are the powerful moments in movies and, and stories in general that you want to evoke something in your audience that they have known to be true but haven't realized on an intellectual level you know you want to evoke you want to you know you don't want to you don't want to pat them on the back and sort of be you know be be you know very sentimental about stuff i don't think i mean in my opinion but but you want to have this sort of universal truth feeling you want to have a feeling of universal truth where people can relate to it and it's just this really powerful moment and oftentimes the way you get there is something that really affected you personally because it's going to ring true you know it's really going to ring true You've been watching A Conversation with Alan Yang on On Story.
OnStory is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's OnStory project, including the OnStory PBS series, now streaming online, the OnStory radio program and podcast in collaboration with Public Radio International, and the OnStory book series available on Amazon. To find out more about OnStory and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com.